Well, thanks, guys. Appreciate that. Uh, every fifth uh, Sunday we have, we have uh, pretty much hymns, and so it's great to just have it changed up a little this morning. Uh, we're so glad you're with us this beautiful fall Sunday morning. We just have a number of uh, things to say, but first of all, thank you on behalf of Marianne and I for all to the kids and everybody, even though they've all run out, um, for, you know, we appreciate you appreciating us. So we really do appreciate you, and it's an honor to be uh, part of the team here at the church and thankful to all the elders and their wives and the deacons and their wives for all that they do in the church too. I mean, we certainly couldn't begin to do what we do if it weren't for you. And thanks to everyone who came out yesterday uh, for uh, helping with, uh, you know, a little bit of everything. And thank you to Ron Bennett for bringing uh, Godzilla out here. He had this huge tractor with this, I don't know what you have on the end of it. It's like a huge lawnmower and you can just chop everything up. So he saved us probably about two days work with that. So thanks, Ron. Um, so we're just going to, a couple announcements this morning. First of all, Zach and Bethany Parker are here. I, I think they're in here. Are they? They're, okay, they're in the back there. Uh, good to have you guys. They, they moved to Missouri, so they have a long commute. So they're not able to come up here every week, but it's great to have you guys here. Uh, they're down in Missouri where New Tribes is, and uh, Zach, Zach has helped us out a lot over the years with uh, the technology part of things here. So good to have you guys here. Um, also, um, we have a baby that's been born to the church, uh, uh, Matt and Emily Sable, uh, their little girl Lexi. So congratulations to them. Uh, we're excited for them with this new addition. And also with the blessing of of a new addition, we just want to acknowledge Carol uh, Gilwin to be with the Lord, and so um, I would just continue to pray for the family. I mean, she is with the Lord, and uh, uh, Mike talks about being jealous, and uh, you know, when we have our loved ones have gone on before us, you know, it, it, we were sad to see them gone, but uh, we and we're going to miss them, but it's so good that we have that hope in Jesus Christ that we will see them again, we'll be reunited with them, and that is a great hope and a tremendous blessing. So uh, her service is going to be in December, so, um, so they can get the whole family together. We're going to have a real celebration. So just continue to pray for the family as they go through uh, the grief of lo losing her. And as I stand up here, they, she would sit there and Al Harrington would sit back there. So they were both like the pillars, by, the guards by the door. So um, whenever I look back there now and they're, they're not there... Um, it's a little sad, you know, it's sad, but, but again, I'm, you know, Al's probably doing, car he, Al and, used to joke, he and Betty, about having a tumbling routine, so I can imagine that's probably what they're, I know it's hard to get your mind around that, but <laughs> anyway, well, let's start with a word of prayer as we, the last song we talked about prayer, and Father, we're thankful that we can come before you today on this beautiful sunny day. You are so good and so faithful Father, we thank you for this country we live in. We thank you for the freedom we have to worship. Thank you for this church and everybody who's here and, and um, Father, who attends and is part of this fellowship. Thank you for the work day yesterday and for all the things that go on behind the scenes, Lord. So many people involved in so many things. And, and Lord, it is truly a privilege to be part of this church family. And it really is a family, God. And I thank you for everyone who's here and for those who couldn't be here today as well. We lift them up, and God, we just pray that you continue to draw us closer to you and to seek you as we live in these last days. Uh, there are truly some uh, difficult things we go through, but Lord, we know that Jesus is going to come back. Jesus is going to take us out of here, and we know that uh, you have a great plan. And as the last song we talked about, when we're in heaven, we're not going to have to pray. Uh, we won't have to pray anymore because we will be in your presence. But we are so thankful that Every single prayer, no matter how small or simple of a child, to the most intense, fervent prayer that we pray, you hear our prayers. And how thankful we are, Father, that just we're these little specks here on this earth. And you care about everything that happens in each and every one of our lives. So we are so grateful to you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Was that an amen I heard over there? Yeah. Okay, while well, we are in... Uh, the letter to uh, Ephesians, and um, Lord, I, I, I just, I'm so excited because there's so many good things in this letter, and so um, just kind of stepping back a little bit to last week, um, I'm just going to read a few verses from last week. 
Um, and, and this was Paul in prison writing to the, the believers to encourage them. And in verse 13, it talks about, I ask thee therefore not to be discouraged because of my suffering for you, which are your glory. Um, don't lose heart when hard times come. And that's my addition to that. Paul was in prison. He was concerned that they were concerned for him. And so they were concerned for him. He was concerned for them as it was understandable. But, but Paul now goes into a prayer that this is, this is such a wonderful high priestly prayer that he prays for these believers. And this is with a, a hunger and a desire and a burden for the people in the church. And his concern for what they were going to go through and what they were going through in the early church and all the changes and all the things that were going on. So he writes in this, this first verses that we're going to look at here in uh, 14 is that, that he talks about this idea of, of dwell time and dwelling with the Lord and having this relationship and having God work in his heart and, and working in our hearts. And so we see that, and that is such an incredible truth because we understand that we all need prayer. We all need the Lord to help us. So anyway, he starts out and he says, for this reason, I kneel before the Father. For this reason, I kneel before the Father. And so he, he, we, we picture Paul in prison, if you would. He's chained to these guards, and he's on his knees, and he's praying on behalf of the people uh, for the fact that he was concerned for them and, and they're concerned for him. But you see this picture of just Paul, this humble servant, kneeling before uh, God and these guards that were chained to him and this, this idea of this, this wonderful man of God humbling himself so very much burdened for his people. Verse 15, For whom the whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray out of his glorious riches that he may strengthen you with power, with strengthen you with power through the spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love and grace and may the power, the power together with all the saints to grasp how, and we'll get to the how in a second, I want to just stop here and kind of back it up a little bit. When he talks about these prayers here, he talks about praying that out of God's glorious riches that they may have the strength. And we receive the Holy Spirit when we become Christians. But he's praying that, that God's strength would well up within us and so that in the midst of the struggles and the battles of life, that this, the riches of God's grace and glory and power would empower us to live extraordinary lives, not just ordinary lives. So a couple of different things when we pray, and I just want to uh, go back to Ephesians chapter 1 when he talks about he prays that the eyes of their hearts may be opened to know God better. So that was one of the first prayers he prays in this letter was that the eyes of their heart would be open to know God better. So we talk about Christianity, and sometimes it can become very impersonal, but Christianity is a relationship with the living God. God desires us through salvation to have a relationship with God. Prior to salvation, we didn't have a relationship with God. The Bible says we were enemies. We were separated from God. So this relationship with the living God is, is crucial to everything in our Christian life. Our everyday walk, our everyday relationship with God is key. And so he's praying that their eyes would be open so they could fully understand who God is and what he was doing in their lives. But there's a couple kinds of prayer that we pray when we're sometimes struggling. And that is, number one, the, when we are in pain, here's kind of our prayer. I don't know about you, but I'll speak for myself. And when I'm in pain sometimes, I want to kind of avoid the pain. I want to just kind of step aside to it. And, and I'll pray and I'll say, you know, Lord, this really hurts. Can you make it stop? This really hurts, God. Can you make it stop? Can you just, like, stop it? I remember years ago, before we had a building, and I remember I used to go to the park and walk around the park and pray and study. On a nice day, I'd sit out on a picnic table and have my books out there, and, and, uh, and I'd pray. And I remember praying that one of my prayers was what, what Paul said, that I may know Christ and the fellowship of his suffering. You've got to be careful when you pray those things. 
You know, seriously, I mean, we, you know, when you, when you pray, Lord, I want to know you, I want to know what it's like to suffer. There's enough of that comes along without praying for it. I'm <laughs> just, just saying. But, but, but it was an earnest desire that I've had to know God better. And when things are great, like I said last week in my message too, that God will never bring us to a point in our lives where we're not needy or dependent upon him. He created us to have a relationship with him. He created us to be dependent upon him and to need him in our lives. And so sometimes we think we can just kind of white knuckle it through things. You know, I got this figured out like guys when you're lost. You're not going to you're not going to go to the GPS or the gas station or look at a map, right? You got this all figured out, right? Yeah, I I remember was it Pittsburgh I drove around. I got lost downtown Pittsburgh and I made the loop around the city like three times and the family thought it was great. I wasn't laughing. But, um, and then, then we stayed at the Empty Arms Hotel because there was no else, you know, 1995 a night when you turn the lights off and the room's moving. Uh, you know, so anyway, but looking at maps, asking for directions is always a good thing. But we tend not to do that. So that the penance, and then the other one is, God, please change my circumstances. So the first one is the pain, stop the pain, stop the music, I want to get off. Or the other one is, Lord, change my circumstances. And we understand that when we're in the midst of difficult circumstances, most of the time we want out. I don't know that anybody enjoys being stuck in an elevator or stuck in traffic or in a place where it seems like there's just no movement. I, I have to be moving all the time. It's kind of the ADD thing, you know. I, when I was in school, I vibrated most of the time, you know. I just the legs were going or the hands were going and... You know, I never got the medication. It probably would have helped, but, uh, uh, but I was always moving. I still am, you know, I'm still moving. Uh, I have one of my sons is like when, when he sits at the kitchen table, you think the legs are going to come off the furniture. He's, he's kind of got that from me, you know, just, I don't know, maybe some of you can relate. Maybe you can't, but anyway, it's not easy, you know. So anyway, but pain, avoiding the pain, change your circumstances. Lord, I don't like this. Please change it. Please change it. So here we, we get to this point here where he talks about this power. Back in 16, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power. Well, how does that happen? Well, he gives us the power as we go. You've all heard that expression, it's hard to steer a parked car, right? You, you know, it, you're not going anywhere, right? The car's parked, you've got the steering wheel going back and forth. Um, the power comes as we are walking in that relationship with God, as we are dependent upon him in prayer, and he is moving through our inner life and our inner, he gives us his power and his strength. Well, th- this word power here is where we go big, back to the Greek, this idea of dynamite. And we know what dynamite does. We know what an explosion does. But here's the power that I believe that Paul is referring to here and hoping that they kind of are able to peer into this truth. And this power is this, to blast out unbelief. You see, he has given us power in the person of the Holy Spirit to not waver in our faith, but to blast out the unbelief in our life. One of the greatest struggles we have sometimes in our Christian lives is believing God that God is good and believing God that he is doing something greater than we can even imagine, right? We, we sometimes wonder, we doubt what God is doing sometimes in our life. And sometimes when you're in the midst of that hurt and that pain is one of the hardest places to be. I remember being in a, a, a bad bicycle accident and I was underage and they took me up to uh, uh, Milwaukee County, John Doyne, or no, it was not John Doyne, it's Freighter now, sorry. I, they changed the name when you've been around as long as I have. And I remember being up there with a broken leg and and all this, and they couldn't touch me until my mom and dad came and signed off. And I remember laying there in that pain and thinking like, any time now, any time now, mom, dad, and you know, and they asked me where my parents were, and I told them they were out shoplifting. That's what my mom used to say, they're going shopping, they're going shoplifting. So they're like, oh, okay, well, we'll put this guy to the back here, you know. (laughs) Well, we're gonna wait on that, you know. But I'm sure my mom and dad had a great sense of humor. And they're like, oh, we're going out shoplifting. So I told the nurse, my parents are out shoplifting. So anyway, they finally got to me and I'm here today to tell the story. But this idea of pain and power 
and God moving and God directing. So the power to overcome unbelief, the power to overcome despair, the power to overcome despair, the power to rise above anything. Now when you think about that, the power that that God has given us through the person of the Holy Spirit, he does all these supernatural things. There's the natural abilities we have as human beings, but when we allow the Spirit of God to guide us and direct us and empower us, it becomes supernatural. So he gives us the ability to rise above the difficult things in life. If you read about the persecuted church, if you read about people who are going through difficult times and and struggling through just crazy things, you begin to see the power of God. I remember being in Guatemala with an individual, started all the radio stations, Christian radio stations pretty much in Latin America. And this man was a genius, and his, his father was a missionary, third generation missionary. And he was telling the story of how out in the, we're in, we're in a small area, kind of a primitive area of Guatemala, and uh, he was telling a story about how um, he lived in Guatemala City, and uh, the, the Indians in the mountains, uh, they would have little transistor radios, battery powered because they didn't have electricity, and they would tune into these Christian radio stations, and they'd end up coming to Christ. I mean, they had no church, they had nothing, they had, didn't have TV, they didn't have power, running water. I mean, really primitive. And this isn't that long ago. But anyway, he said, this individual walked for three days with a bag of coffee beans to find him, to come to his house, to thank him for the radio station that he wanted to. I mean, three, he walked three days with a bag full of beans to say thank you for I mean, that just, I mean, that just humbled me. But the, just the stories of these guys erecting these radio towers up in the mountains with nothing, with no money, and how God worked. And so out of that, that struggle that they had to do these things, they were reaching Latin America in places that nobody, nobody could go. And this guy walked for days just to, and it, you know, I think of that, it's just so humbling. So we see this power to, to rise above complacency and apathy and, and uh, anything in our lives and, and despair that comes into our lives and unbelief that enters into our lives because the enemy is always trying to convince us that God is not able. The enemy is always trying to convince us that there really is no real power in Christianity. There's nothing different than us and any other religion in the world. But that's a lie right from hell. There is power in knowing God. There's power in the word of God. There's power with the Holy Spirit of God living within us because you're all here today. Because you could all be doing something else this morning, right? I mean, and, and so the fact that you're here this morning tells me, and I believe, that God led you here. Because I pray, I pray every week, I pray that God will bring people to church um, and, uh, and that God will work in people's lives. And so we're here as a testimony to the power of God in our lives. And every one of you has a wonderful testimony of what God has done and what God is doing and what God will do in your lives. And uh, I was talking to the youth this morning, the teenagers, about being temples and having God dwell within us and what, what that's like to be a living temple of God walking into darkness, bringing light into darkness, no matter where you are, no matter what you do, we're bringing light into darkness. We're bringing truth where there's lies. That's powerful stuff. And kids, all of us are part of that. No matter where you work, no matter what you do, we're bringing light. We are salt. We are light. We are bringing truth. We are bringing uh, integrity. We are bringing honesty. We're bringing a, a, a mercy and a care from God into that place, wherever that is. And that is powerful. So he goes on to say here that... Um, that this power to dwell in our hearts uh, through Christ. And I pray that your, your being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide, and, and now try to envision this, okay? He's, what he's saying here is how wide, the width is infinite, how long is infinite, height is infinite, depth is infinite, is the love of Christ. It's the love of Christ. So what Paul is saying here is only through the power of the Holy Spirit of God, only through us in a living relationship with God, and normally through failed lives. When we have failed in our lives, or we've stumbled, we've fallen, we've made mistakes, maybe we've done horrible things, even as Christians, okay, even as Christians, what he's saying here is the love of God goes beyond and it shatters all the barriers, all the walls. 
And, and as, if you try to imagine something, and it's, I call it like the Grand Canyon of grace. If you've ever been to the Grand Canyon, you know, and you step out, especially when you don't have like the, the rails and that, you kind of go to the edge, you see how close you can get to like not falling over, but you're like, whoa, that's really deep. That's really big. That's huge, you know. And, and, and the Grand Canyon is just even a small example. That doesn't even really give us a full picture of the grace and the love of God. But, you know, um, and, and this, is, this is where we, we, the grace and the love of God comes in, and it's, it's um, what, what I refer to as trusting the donkey. Okay, now let me get, just, before you get excited here, trusting the donkey. They have Grand Canyons. In the Grand Canyon, they have donkeys that take people down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon and up every day. Now, when you're trusting in the donkey... When the donkey is stumbling over the edge, because I've done this, they're coming around the edge, you know, and they're stumbling, and you, there's like this sheer drop-off, and you're on the top of a donkey, and your first reaction is like, I'll get off and I'll carry the donkey. Because <laughs> I trust me more than I trust that donkey, but the donkeys know what they're doing, and they don't fall every day. <laughs> but when you're on the donkey and they're stumbling around, it's scary. Well, what do you do? You trust the donkey. Balaam trusted the donkey. Actually, he didn't trust the donkey. You know the story of Balaam? He was given a message, and, or he was going to go out and find out what Israel was doing, and he was to come back and report. And, and anyway, the donkey saw an angel of the Lord in the road stopping Balaam, and, and he was beating the donkey. He wasn't trusting the donkey, and the donkey had seen an angel of the Lord, and finally the angel of the Lord appeared to Balaam and said, why are you beating the donkey? He's trying to save your life here. So we have to trust the instincts that we have in the person of the Holy Spirit as he is guiding us. And see, the thing is, the Holy Spirit will never mislead you. Isn't that great to know? The Holy Spirit of God, the power of God, will never mislead you and lead you down a path of destruction. If you follow the prodding and the leading of the Holy Spirit of God, because he is holy, he's going to guide us and direct us in life. If we trust him, for what God is doing in our lives. And so this is what Paul is saying. I want you to understand the Holy Spirit's work in your life. I want you to trust God and believe that God is doing something supernatural in your life that's truly out of this world. So here's this picture of God's grace, God's mercy, and God's trust. 19, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the measure of all the fullness of God the measure of all the fullness of God. Now you think about, you know, it's hard to get your mind, well, we can't get our mind around God. These puny minds that we have can't even begin to understand the greatness and the love and the mercy of God. But this idea of measure, back in this culture, there would be people when they would measure things on a a scale, and, uh, you know, you'd get a measure of this, a measure of that, and they would, they would, the scales would be imbalanced, and so people would be cheated many times. So it, what Paul is saying here is in God's method of justice, in God's method of grace, the scales are balanced. You will get the full measure. You're not going to get cheated. Sometimes, especially young people, the world will tell you this, to do things your way and not do things God's way. Don't wait on God. You just do your thing your way, your time. Guess what? That never works out. Never works out. Instant gratification is never good for anybody. We all want it. We all, we all think we want it. It's one of the worst things that can happen is for God to give you your inheritance before you're ready. Isn't that good? But here's the deal. God has given us an inheritance, but it's as we walk in our relationship with him and we learn to trust him more and more, God gives us more and more grace. He gives us more and more opportunities in your life. Picture an example is faithfulness. God says what? If you're faithful with a little, I do what? I give you more. And so when you're faithful with more, what does he do? He gives you more. And, and that's great. Even with understanding, you know, we pray we want to know God. But here's the thing. What are you going to do with what God reveals to you? Are you going to take it home and hide it? Are you going to pretend? You know, you all know a lot more of the Bible than you probably even realize. And that's another lie I believe the enemy tries to tell us is that you don't know enough. Like, I don't know enough to share Jesus. What does evangelism look like? I don't know how to lead anyone to Jesus. You don't need to know how to lead anyone to Jesus. God does all the heavy lifting. All you got to do is just tell your story. Just tell people your story. How did you come to know Jesus? That's it. You don't got to go to school. You don't need a degree. You don't need to go through a class. It's very simple. Just tell your story. And that's one of the lies the enemy has for us is that 
Gee whiz, I don't know how to, what if they ask me a question I don't know? Simple answer. Tell them you don't know. There you go, right? If you don't know, and see, here's what you say is, you know what, that's a great question. I don't really know the answer to that, but I'll find out. You can call me, and then I'll tell you I don't know. But, <laughs> no, I'll look it up. But, you know, seriously, seriously, so much of the fears and the doubts that we have in doing what God wants us to do is we don't believe, we don't trust him. We aren't walking in that relationship of intimacy. You know, it's, it's like someone, well, how did you meet your wife? How did you get married? What's kept you married? All these different things, God is working in and through this story, our story, his story. It's his story. It's his story. So anyway, um, I love these truths. I just love this because it speaks to my heart and it, and, it, and it just brings me literally to my knees that we walk in him, we trust him. There's no dead ends. There's a lot of detours, and I don't like detours, but you know what? Here's what's interesting. Um, when we are on detours, if you're, if you're in a hurry, detours are really a pain, aren't they? I mean, you're trying to get somewhere fast. But when you're, like, not in a hurry and you're, you have a detour, you can say, hmm, I'm on a detour, and maybe God's taken me a different way to show me something I wouldn't see if I was going the same old way. Hear what I'm saying? The detours of life, the things that God is placing in our lives sometimes that are an inconvenience, or maybe they're slowing us down, taking us in a different direction, are really things of God that God is doing in our lives to try to show us something we would never see if we kept going the same direction. We're all kind of creatures of habit, aren't we? I mean, we kind of tend to fall into certain patterns in life, and I believe that God is trying to shake us up a lot of times uh, to get our attention, but we really resist that in our lives. And so going back to what Paul is saying here is that he wants to teach us a love and a dependence upon him. He wants us to understand that we need him and that we're not God, he is God. And uh, I just... uh, I was just something just popped into my head here. I was just thinking about this. I think it's about being out of control. We all want to be in control, right? I mean, we all want to be in control. Part of what God wants to do in our lives is to bring us to that point where we're not in control. How many of you guys like to drive with your wives? I saw, I saw a great sticker, a thing, a plaque in a restaurant, uh, and it said, I do all the driving, or my wife does all the driving, I just hang onto the steering wheel. Right? Am I right? Am I right? Am I right? Um, I, I, Marianne never does that to me. No, but no, but serious, serious. I, I love it. It says, I just, yeah, I, I just, it's so good, you know, because you know, you, you've, you know, the other, the other thing, the other thing is the GPS. If my wife is holding the GPS, it says how fast I'm going. See, I, I got this. I can see the speedometer here, and she can't see it, you know. And she was like, oh, you know, you're going a little, fa-, you know, so anyway. <laughs> out of control. We're out of control. And, and the best part of being out of control is we know that God is ultimately always in control. He is always in control. And so when I'm out of control, that pushes me out of my comfort zone. That's not a bad thing. Because what happens when we're out of our comfort zone, that's when all the praying begins, right? That's when all the the seeking the Lord and and crying out to God begins is when we are out of control in our lives and we don't know where this thing is going. So that brings us back to a place of being totally dependent upon him. And that brings us back to those power words, that picture of, of power to overcome doubt and fears and anxiety and worry, all those things God is dealing with and doing a great work. So he talks about the measure of the fullness of God. And I, I just, that goes beyond my comprehension because every time I think I've understood something, like I've been, I've taught this through this book different times over the last, I've been a Christian over 40 years. I can't tell you how many times I've been through this book through home Bible studies or preaching or whatever. And you know what? I'm finding things here I've never seen before. You know, and that might scare you. But the reality is, I'm seeing things because guess what? I'm in a different place today than I was a year ago and two years ago and three years ago, even a month ago. Isn't that great that our God, is, his word is alive, 
It's, bre- it's the breath of God. It's the living word of God. And we're living beings and we're filled with the spirit of God. And God is doing something in your lives today, right here, right now. Right here, right now. That's what he wants to do. That is, that is the God we worship. He's not some dead statue or, you know, you can go to some basilica somewhere and pet one of the apostles' skulls for 50 cents. They got places like that. You don't go pet the apostles' skulls. Maybe it's up to a buck now. I don't know. Or, you know, there's holy places you can go where you get close with God. You're sitting next to the indwelling presence of God right now. You know that? God is here. God is omnipresent. God knows all things. The Holy Spirit is here this morning. We don't have to pray that he shows up. He's here. If you're here, the Holy Spirit's here. You may not want him here, uh, but he's here. But the reality is this, is God is in this process of taking us out of our comfort zone, teaching us this grand canyon of love and understanding who he is every day of our lives. Now we get to the best part, and as we finish here with kind of the doxology of this prayer that Paul has, and... um, Man, I'll tell you, one of the things I just want to say before I move here, with the the awareness of the Holy Spirit, Scripture tells us where to keep in step with the Holy Spirit, where to walk with the Holy Spirit. Okay, now, have you ever, Marianne and I like to walk. I don't know if you as couples like to walk or whatever. But if you're walking together and one of you is like two, three feet ahead or behind the other person, how is it that you're walking with them? You ever tried to talk to somebody and they're like five paces ahead of you and you're like, well... You know, let me just want to, you know, it's like, it's better to be like here, right? Walking in step, right? Normally when you walk uh, in step with someone, you're walking in step with them. They're like right next to you, not in front of you, not behind you, right? You're walking in step. This is the picture of the Holy Spirit. God wants us to walk in step with the Holy Spirit. When you're walking in step with the Holy Spirit, guess what's taking place? Real communication. Part of communication isn't just verbal, We've heard of body language. I know you're all giving off something right now with your body language. Okay. Um, (laughs) Let's try this. With with walking in step with God, we're we're communicating directly with him, and we're not going to miss, we're not going to misunderstand what he's saying. by, By walking, now we don't see God in the sense of seeing God or the Holy Spirit, but there is that consciousness of us walking in step with the Spirit of God. So that's why when the Spirit of God is prodding you, there's, I call it maybe guilt, twinges of guilt, or, or, or feelings of being uncomfortable in a situation. Have you ever been somewhere where you felt you shouldn't be and you felt really uncomfortable? Or maybe you've said something to somebody and you regret saying it and you felt uncomfortable? That's the Holy Spirit saying, time out, time out. I was talk, sharing with the youth this morning about being salt and light. That's like sometimes if you're in the middle of a conflict, you're in a conflict with somebody, somebody needs to be the bigger person and say, I'm sorry. In, in conflict, sometimes we've got to stop and realize, whoa, what did I just do or what did I just say? Or sometimes we're completely unaware of it. Unaware of it. Do you guys ever get elbowed? Or ladies, do you ever get elbowed? Do the kids ever get elbowed? And I see you guys looking at each other like all the time, right? You know, so, but, the, but the reality is that is a prodding from your husband or your wife or the kids or, yeah, stop it. Okay. <laughs> or, or even the pets. I, we, have, we, we have pets that we didn't have and the pets are always prodding me to either feed them or take them outside, right? Like, and if I don't do that, things happen. <laughs> so prodding is very important that we're sensitive to what's going on around us. Very important. And we can hinder the work of the Spirit of God by ignoring those proddings. And the scary thing is, when we talk about this dwelling of God dwelling within us, Jesus, the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, the picture, the word picture here in the Greek is the idea of allowing God, the Holy Spirit, to dwell within your house. Jesus, the Holy Spirit of God, the presence of God is dwelling within you, and you're giving him permission to live in your house. When you give someone permission to live in your house, is there anything off, off guard or off limits? Probably not. I mean, if you have a house guest, they have the, pretty much the reign of your house, or you say, okay, here's your room. You can have this room here, but you can't have any other access in the house. The picture here of dwelling is allowing the Spirit of God to have full access to everything all the time, regardless. The attic, the basement, the garage, 
the closet, every, you're giving the Spirit of God that presence to dwell within you, to, to, be, to live within you, to be housed within you. There again, that's such an important part of this picture, to walk in step with, to allow him the freedom in our lives. Now for the conclusion, verse 20, verse 20. And I love this. Mary Ann used this as kind of like her mantra prayer uh, for our family, for our children. Mary Ann prays this for the kids all the time. Uh, This is a great closing prayer to Paul's prayer. But anyway, it's great. Listen to this. Now to him who is able, okay, God God is all-powerful. One of his attributes, he is all-powerful. Now to him who is able to do, okay? Now to him who is able to do what? Everything and anything he wants to do. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably, what does immeasurably mean? Without measure, right? I mean, like, it's kind of incomprehensible. It's like, you can't measure. It's like saying, well, how, how vast is the universe? How big is the universe? You can't measure it because it goes beyond anything we can even comprehend. As much as we think we know, we don't know anything. You know, it's like with our DNA and how, how unique our DNA is. It's like, it's immeasurable. It's, it, it's incomprehensible. So I just love this. Now to him, to God, glory to God is what he's saying. Now to him, focus on God, who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. Whoa. Did you, did you get that? I mean, I'll say it again because I, I, want, I want you to grasp this. Now, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. So what God is saying is the universe, the wisdom, the knowledge, the love, the grace and mercy of God, that God is, you know, picture a funnel, funneling into us, he's able to do within us and through us things that we can't even imagine. There are things that God has for us to do that you can't even imagine. There's kids in here who are going to do things that you can't, as parents, we can't even imagine. There's things going to happen in your life as a chain reaction <clears throat> of the grace and the mercy of God that are unimaginable. They're beyond us. Marianne was, uh, I came home yesterday from the work day and Marianne was at the kitchen table and she was studying and, and she was weeping. And, and uh, just over the grace of God and her burden to see people come to know Jesus. And I'm like, that's my wife. She's awesome. She's awesome. And she was talking about 44 years ago when she got saved. And I'm not going to tell the rest of the story, but, but anyway, just reflecting on what God had done in this woman's basement in Chicago who had been missionaries with new tribes in her basement, hundreds of young people every week coming to Jesus. And I'm not exaggerating. I was trained to do evangelism at, this, at a table in this woman's basement because we were leading people to Jesus every night, every week. Mary Ann's brother came. I led her brother to Christ. That was before I even was dating Marianne. People were getting saved. saved. It was the Jesus people movement back then. I mean, people were getting saved all the time. There was, a, uh, there was a guy that showed up at this Bible study one time. He was in a gang in Milwaukee and he had thrown a man off a freeway bridge and killed him. And he, he shows up at the Bible study down there and I knew this guy. His last name was Mudrock. Okay? And this was a family. These guys were some pretty tough guys. And I knew this family uh, from, from where I lived in West Dallas, and he's in his Bible study in this woman's basement in Chicago. And I'm like, I'm like, what are you doing here? He goes, I've come to know Jesus. I'm living in Chicago now. I'm involved in this Jesus ministry in Chicago. And I'm like, oh my goodness, he, was, he didn't go to jail. I mean, he should have gone to jail. But here he is, he's saved now. And I'm like, you know, this guy just shows up. So what I'm saying is, God wants to do more than we're letting. We're not, we don't let God do enough in our lives. We're, li- we're always limiting what God can do. We're telling God what he can and can't do, don't we? And, and God is saying, I want to do more, immeasurably more. Then you, can, you can't even comprehend what I want to do in your life. How many of you could sit here this morning, you can raise your hand if you want, has God done things in your life beyond what you could have imagined? 
Yeah, amen, 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 amen. Yeah, yeah, probably every one of us, if we're honest, would say, God has God given me grace to get through this time in my life. God has done this in my life. God has done that in my life. God has helped me with cancer. God has helped me with this. Or, you know, God has done all these things. How wonderful. What a great God. But anyway, I'm getting excited now. So he goes on to say here, he's at work within us, the Holy Spirit. And then he goes on to say here now, and this, this is one of my, it's all my favorite, okay? I'm just going to be honest. To him be glory in the church. Okay, stop everything right now. Time out. To him be glory in the church. Do you know that you are bringing glory to God this morning? You're here to worship, to fellowship. Glory to God in the church. Do you know how wonderful it is that we are instruments of praise and worship to our great God and Savior? That glory in the church. He's not talking about the building. He's talking about us. We are the church. And what he is saying here is he's given us all this. He wants us to understand this so that we reflect back glory to him. Have you ever taken a mirror outside and caught the reflection of the sun and then shined it somewhere? You, it's like blinding, isn't it? That's the reflection of the glory of God. We are to reflect the glory of God to the people around us. Do we always feel like it? No. But you know what? Even in our worst moments, we're still bringing glory to God whether we like it or not. Because you know what God has promised us? That he who has begun a good work in us will be faithful to complete it. Whether you like it or not, we're all going to end up looking like and being like Jesus. We're all going to have the image of Christ within us. We are image bearers, but that's where we're headed. That's what we're doing. Is that not exciting? Okay. I don't, I don't believe it. I don't think you... You know what? Here, I just got to tell you this. We got to get a little more excited around your one song. I'm just keeping it real here. I mean, it's like, you know... Yeah, amen. Thank you. No, but seriously, there's so much good and wonderful and great thing, not because I'm up here doing what I'm doing, because God is great. God is wonderful. He is worthy to be praised. He's worthy to be worshipped. I mean, he, is, he saved us. He's delivered us. He's given us so much... So much, and he said, to, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, <clears throat> forever and ever. Listen, there's a quote that uh, evangelist, this uneducated man in Chicago, got saved, working in a shoe store, and he, 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 he became D.L. Moody. We know him as D.L. Moody, and this guy changed the world. He was completely uneducated. I have read some of his manuscripts, and they're a lot like mine, but I've read some of his manuscripts of that he wrote for his messages. And of course, everything you read from D.L. Moody has been cleaned up. I'm just keeping it real. Here's a man who's uneducated. Uneducated. And he just, he loved Christ. And so he comes to church, he goes, I want to work, I want to be in ministry. And they're like, well, you know, just get lost. Uh, if you want a ministry, you go start your own. So he did. And whenever you see pictures of Dale Moody, he's got all these kids and they're all dirty, filthy kids from like the, the ghetto of Chicago. And here's Moody, the Sunday school teacher. And there was a story I heard about him. <clears throat> uh, he was going out, he would round up kids, run up and down the streets and the alleys to find kids to bring to his Sunday school class. And there was this little girl, <clears throat> I'm sorry, you choked up. This little girl, and she ran away from him. He chased her down the alley. She ran in the house, up the stairs, and dove under her bed. Moody ran up the stairs into the bedroom and dove under the bed with her and pulled her, pulled her out by the ankles. And this is, this is what this girl <clears throat> recounts now years later as a grown woman. That day, Mr. Moody dragged me from hell and into heaven. Moody chased her down the streets, ran. You do that today, you'll go to jail, Right? <laughs> But the reality is, and so this is, this is what Moody heard, and this is what Moody said at, when he was a younger man. He was in Ireland, I believe, at the time, and he had heard a man by Varney who was an evangelist. The world has yet mm, to see what God will do with a man or woman fully consecrated to him. I will be that man. Moody strove to be that man. Simple guy, uneducated guy, but the power of God, and he devoted his, his life to starting Bible institutes and making those institutes uh, where people could attend for next to nothing. 
I mean, and God used Moody in a mighty powerful way, just a simple man of God. But if we would say to God this morning, you know, Lord, I don't know, where, I don't know what I'm doing right now in my, per, my personal walk with you, but Lord, I pray that you will take me deeper, that you will draw me closer to you, that I would have a greater sphere of influence wherever you have me in my life today, to, to just pray simple prayers. You see, one of the things we've been studying on Wednesday nights, and guys, you're invited, to the Wednesday night study on a book by Charles Stanley, is here's the deal. We got all the Holy Spirit we need. The Holy Spirit's just waiting for us. He's just waiting for us. He's there. He's, he's ready to do the work. He's just saying, I'm waiting on you. Whenever you're ready, you're ready to go with me and walk in step with me, here I am. And that never ends. No matter how far you've drifted from God, some people have drifted from God. Some people are far away from God. But God's never far away from us. He's always there. Let's pray. Father, this morning as we come to you, we are in awe of your goodness, your grace, and mercy. Father, you want to do great things in our lives. If only we'll let you. You, you want to bring glory to yourself through using us simple people, just people who love you. And so, Father, we pray that if there's someone here this morning who's never put their trust in Christ, none of this really makes a lot of sense. Some of it does, maybe not much of it. But all they have to do is put their faith in Jesus Christ. So I just would ask if there's anybody here this morning, Lord, that's in that place where they have never put their trust in Christ and said, Lord, I'm a sinner. I need help. I can't do this. Uh, Lord, here I am. I trust that Jesus died for me, took my place for my sin, and he rose from the dead and is alive. He triumphed over death. He conquered the grave. He bought us back with a ransom, with his own blood, so we could have a relationship with you. It's so simple, Lord. So I just pray if there's someone here this morning, that, Lord, you would speak to them, and that they, before they leave, they would talk to me or one of our leaders here, or anybody who maybe brought them, God, that they would just say, here I am. I don't maybe understand it all, but I want to know Jesus. And so, God, you are so good and faithful. That's how we, it all begins. God, you have so much more for us, and we, it, it goes beyond our comprehension. We can't comprehend how much you want to fill us with your presence to have us experience God-sized opportunities. I think of the children this summer looking for God workings around them, looking for God sightings. Father, forgive us so many times we're so busy, we don't look for God sightings. So, Father... I pray you just move our hearts today to draw it closer to you, to have a deeper relationship with you, or to even start to have a relationship with you in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen.